So when people make such claims on the internet or all over the world, what they are really saying, don't follow Abu Hanifa, don't follow Shafi, don't follow Imam Malik, don't follow Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, follow Sahih Hadith only. But oh, you don't know whether that Hadith is really Sahih. You don't know whether that Hadith is, is mansukh or not. And even if it is classified as Sahih, it's not been classified as Sahih by Rasulullah. It's been classified as Sahih by other Muhaddisun. So if you're going to follow another man's opinion at the end of the day, then what's wrong with following the opinion of a man whose opinion has already been followed over for 12 centuries? So we can't get away from the fact that all of us, all of us are blind followers and we have no choice but to be blind followers. Because if somebody says this is Sahih Hadith, how are you going to guarantee 100% it is Sahih? It's not the Prophet didn't say it, another man said it. And Imam Bukhari, Rahimahullah, for example, in his compilation, there are eight, nine chains. Imam Bukhari didn't meet them all. He only had to base his judgment on what he heard, hearsay. So you have to place your trust blindly on Imam Abu Hanifa or Albani or other Muhaddisun or Bin Baz that what he is saying is Sahih. And is it really Sahih? You can argue all night and all day till Qiyamah and you will go round and round. We've got no choice but to place blind trust. So when people make such claims on the internet or all over the world, what they are really saying, don't follow Abu Hanifa, don't follow Shafi, don't follow Imam Malik, don't follow Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, follow Sahih Hadith only. But oh, you don't know whether that Hadith is really Sahih. You don't know whether that Hadith is, is mansukh or not. And even if it is classified as Sahih, it's not been classified as Sahih by Rasulullah. It's been classified as Sahih by other Muhaddisun. So if you're going to follow another man's opinion at the end of the day, then what's wrong with following the opinion of a man whose opinion has already been followed about for 12 centuries? So we can't get away from the fact that all of us, all of us are blind followers and we have no choice but to be blind followers. Because if somebody says this is Sahih Hadith, how are you going to guarantee 100% it is Sahih? It's not the Prophet didn't say it, another man said it. And Imam Bukhari, Rahimahullah, for example, in his compilation, there are eight, nine chains. Imam Bukhari didn't meet them all. He only had to base his judgment on what he heard, hearsay. So you have to place your trust blindly on Imam Abu Hanifa or Albani or other Muhaddisun or Bin Baz that what he is saying is Sahih. And is it really Sahih? You can argue all night and all day till Qiyamah and you will go round and round. We've got no choice but to place blind trust. <laughs> Seek refuge with Allah against the accursed devil. Woman Ahsana Kaul and Min Manda, Ilallah, who Amila Salihan Wakala in the Limina Muslimin, and who is better in speech than one who invites to Allah and acts righteous and says, Indeed, I am of the Muslims. Hazi Sabili Adu Ilallah, Allah Basiratin, Anna, Woman Tabani, was over Anna Lahi, Wama, and Amila Mushurkin. This is my way I invite to Allah by perception. I and whoever follows me and glory be to Allah, for I am not among their idolaters. Alhakumir Rabbikum Famansha Fali Umin Wamansha Faliafu. The truth is from your thoughts, so whoever wills let him believe and whoever wills let him disbelieve. Ya you Allah Zina Amanutakullah Wakunu Ma Aswadikin. Oh you who believe, beware of God and be with those who are honest, that is who are truthful. Uh, thank you all ladies and gentlemen for the time and patience. Uh, today we are going to uh, basically have like a discussion where we are going to use our rationale. Uh, we are going to use rationale. And uh, when we say rationale, uh, rationale, you can say uh, the fundamental reasons or logic behind something or what something which gives you the justification for something so it's like a, using your logic you understand a, in a in a more uh, in a way that corresponds with a fundamental 
way of reasoning. So if you are in any part of, of any religion and you, you fail to use your rationality and you decide to stick with emotions, then there's something is wrong, you know. So so what I what I try my best to do most many a times is to help the people to to uplift themselves and find a way to use their rationality. You know, and instead of putting emotions first, try to put always put rationality first. Let the emotions just be at the back. Don't bring the emotions forward. And this is why sometimes people cannot handle some of the things I say. I say it as it is. I say it as simple as it is. You understand? But I, I know majority cannot carry it, cannot hold uh, on what I say, you know. So... That is a point. Uh, peace be upon you, Christ, Christian uh, Marchinech. Uh, salam Narapa. Salam to you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so, uh, by the way, this is the, the hardcover for the Refer to the Quran hardcover book. Refer to the Quran. Uh, it is a 60 pages book. And if you, for, for those who have the PDF, for those who have the PDF version, uh, you see the titles. That is the titles here. The table content, it has a title. The book, it tells you what the book is. The, this book, the Quran, the Revelation, Inspiration, Hadith, Sunnah, Truth, Verses of God, Christians, Muslims, Believers, The Submission, Questions, and The Wake Up Call. So this is a hardcover, and it's available on uh, payheap.com. Uh, slash Natsal Enterprise, or you find it on holvi.com slash shop slash Natsal. You get it there, you buy, you get it shipped as possible. And this one helps you to actually break down or understand the Quran in a more fashionable way, right? It's only, it's a, it's a comprehensible or comprehensive tool to aid you uh, just like my my lectures aid people in understanding the Quran in a better way. Likewise, the book that I wrote, written by me, myself, helps people to understand uh, better. So that is the Refer to the Quran book. It's a hardcover book and, you know, uh -huh, and with the serial number, everything. Then we have the, the Great Quran. This is also the hardcover with the serial number that <clears throat> over a thousand pages, you see, and it has the Arabic, the translation and the transliteration. I've made it actually the easiest way, even somebody who is not a Muslim can actually pay attention to the book and read it with ease and understand what the book is about or what the words are about, right? So this is the great Quran translation done by me it took me six years to translate this book. And this is the closest translation you can get that actually helps you to understand the Quran in a more fashionable way or in a better form, right? So that is also available on the payhip.com slash natural enterprise. Or you contact me, I can send you the link where you can get the hardcover. And this one ships all over the world. It goes all over the world, whether US, whether Canada, whether Australia, whether Africa, wherever. However, I'm working on trying to get these copies published in Ghana, where, like in Africa, it can be like the center hub where people can get it as easy as possible, inshallah. You know, so these are the two books now available, and I'm working on the third book, which is the Refer to the Quran Part 2. Uh, but I have some obstacles uh in front so i just want to clear such before I, I move on yes but for those who need the pdf version if you need a great quran they refer to the quran if you need a pdf and you have a direct contact with me kindly contact me i'll give you a copy for free inshallah yeah however i put it on uh, google play store and i have the pdf online somewhere where is is being offered at a, at a lowest price but all this is due to uh, in between, usually I mean, five months, six months, I do organize charity, uh, you know, works. 
whereby I do feed people back in my home country where I, I, I was born. So I go, we find the old people, the helpless ones, especially, and we feed them. I do that usually every six months and uh, the next one will be happening. I think I'll be doing one next month. So I'll be organizing that. So through this, whatever I sell to through the PDF versions, I make sure I put this money aside to help this uh, charity works, right? Because I do, I even though I organize the donation, I do donate my own money inside to help because initially I started with my own money. Then people started showing me support. You know, here and there I have people who say, hey brother, is it any project you're doing? We want to show support, we want to donate. You know, so personally, I would say, Alhamdulillah, I'm self-sufficient uh, for now. So I don't think I want to rely on somebody's donation to feed me or feed my family or something. So what I do is the best I can do in the possible way through the channels I have is to actually now use that to help people uh, somewhere else. Uh, so as it is, today's topic, we are going to use rationale, right? And we are going to break things down whereby. Uh, so uh, I'm going to quote a verse, Quran chapter 2, uh, verse 44, right? And if possible, let's see if I can share the screen. And I'll be giving chance for question and answer where people, I, I will even put down the link. If you're willing to have something to say, I'll give you the chance to, to hop on to the view. When you go to Quran chapter 2, verse 44, God says, Ata'amuruna, Ata'amuruna nas bilbir. Then he says, Watansawuna anfusakum, wa antum tatuluna likitab. Now God is saying, are you commanding the people to righteousness or with righteousness while forgetting yourselves? Are you commanding the people to righteousness while forgetting yourselves or with righteousness while forgetting yourselves and you read the book or while you read the book or you recite the book? right you recite the book because we do have people who recite it now reading the book actually entails you taking the book in your hands to actually read it then we have people who recite the book right so even though with the recitation we have people who are commanding they are suggesting to the people with to be righteous but they forget themselves while they still recite the book will you then not reason so this is something that as the saying goes, you have to practice what you preach. If you want to be the, an advocate of telling people the truth, you have to be the practitioner yourself in order to tell people, advise people what needs to be done. You can't just go to the people and say, hey, you have to be righteous while forgetting yourselves. You see, so uh -huh, this is something also uh, people need to be cautious of. Then again, I quote in the same chapter, I take you to... Uh, uh, verse 42 in verse 2 chapter 2 verse 42 yes, salam, chapter 2 verse 42 it says mm -hmm. it says and do not cover when we say it's a verb for the word for the noun libas libas is like a, a covering a shirt clothing so it's a verb for the word for the noun libas libas is like a, a covering a shirt clothing right so the word talibis Lebisa is like to cover something, to conceal something. Just like I'm using the shirt to cover my body, right? Uh -huh. So when we say talibis, it's like you, you, you put on something or you cover something. So God now is saying, do not use, the, do not use falsehood, right? Bilbatl, do not use falsehood to cover the truth. Wala talibis al-haq bilbatl. So don't use falsehood to cover the truth. And what is the truth? We know the book of God is the truth, right? The book of God is the truth, not the book of Hadith, not anything else, but the book of God is the truth. That's the, the Quran. So God is now telling us, while concealing the truth while you know, and concealing 
wa taktumu. The word taktumu comes from the a verb katama. Katama means to hide something, to conceal it. To, you know, understand? To, to seal it, to conceal something so that nobody will see it. So what people do is they will use falsehood like the Hadith books to cover the truth of the Quran and conceal the truth while they know. So God is warning us, right? People who do that, they know what they are doing. The scholars who hide the truth, they know what they are doing. The, the preachers you see, the clerics, the whatever you see around you, they know what they are doing. They know what is the truth and they know what is falsehood. But they intentionally want to hide the truth, even though they know it is the truth, right? Aha. Uh -huh. So I started by quoting chapter 2, verse 44. Where he says, are you commanding the people with righteousness, right? Are you commanding the people with righteousness while forgetting yourselves and you recite the book? So if you, are, you actually recite the book, you should see the truth which is stated there for you and for anybody else. So why, forget, why do you forget yourselves? And then you go out instructing the people something else. You see? Uh -huh. So this command was actually also given to the, the people of the book. In the past, it was given to them in Quran chapter 3, verse 71. The same command distracted. You see, the same command again. God is one. And I will come into that. I will come into that. Uh, uh, yes, Quran chapter 3, verse 71. That is Surah Al Al Imran, verse 71. It says, I can share the screen. Let me let me share the screen to that so that we see the verse. Yeah. So here, Quran chapter 3, verse 71. It says, Ya Allah Kitab. Oh, people of the book, right? Lima talibisun al haq bilibatil, wa taktumun al haq, wa antum ta'alamun. He says, Oh, people of the book, why? Well, the, word, the word lima, it means why. It's a question. And this is a question always comes why because an error has been committed. So it's a negative question. Whenever a why is asked, which means something has gone wrong, right? So why do you cover the truth with falsehood? And you conceal the truth while you know. Why do you do that? People of the book, why do you do that? For those who claim they are Jews, they are Christians, they are Sabians, they are Magians, they are whatever you, you claim you have the book of God, the Krishna, you whatever book you claim you have and it's the book of God, why do you conceal the truth it states in there? And you use falsehood to cover the truth while you know, you know it, you see. Uh, so just like when a criminal is guilty, he knows he's guilty, but he will cover the truth because he doesn't want to be exposed. You see, uh -huh. so now I know somebody might be asking that what does the, the, the main topic of discussion got to do uh, with this issue? Uh, so yeah. So I quoted chapter 2, verse 42, and chapter seven, uh, chapter 3, verse 71. And then the last one is Quran chapter 17, verse 36, right? I take you to Surah Al-Isra'i, chapter 17. Then I take you to verse 36. Let's see what the uh, verse says. Verse 36. Verse 36. Uh, I can share the screen to that. Let me share the screen. Yeah. So in that verse, God says, "Wala takhafu ma laysa laka bi ilm. Inna as-sama'a wal basara wal fu'ad kullu ulaika kana anhu mas'ula." He says, "Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Indeed, the hearing, the eyesight, and the mind, right? All those will be accountable thereof or we will be answerable." When we say mas'ula, it's a, it's a, the verb is sa'al. 
to ask question to question right so masula means it like a place where you be where you be questioned you'll be held accountable right so all those all those it says kullu kullu means all those meaning all the your hearing your eyesight your mind you'll be questioned thereof so this is where rational comes in you used to you need to use your logic you need to use your akal it is very very important as a human being right you need to use your akal even animals they do use their akal right and i'll be quoting some verses where you see how god made such a comparison with with human beings and animals right aha uh -huh. i'll be coming to that so let me quote again this uh let me uh, let break down this verse i just recited he says wala takafu this takafu means to pursue something to follow something so you pursue something you have no knowledge thereof and you are doing it you get up you are doing five salats because your scholars told you you are doing it you get up you say you are doing siam you don't know what the quran says about the siam you had your scholars doing you saw your parents doing and you are also doing it right so these are all involved in what God says. People will be practicing something in Islam, yet they don't have answers to it. And they, they seem to uphold it as the truth. Whilst forgetting that there is a potential threat that people, and there's a possibility, and it's a threat that people will be concealing the truth with falsehood while they know, like the scholars, they know. They lie to you, they know. It's, look the scholars scholars you are seeing out there they are not ignorant they know what they are doing so they will hide the truth with falsehood mm? that's what they do aha uh -huh. <clears throat> yeah sorry so when quran chapter 17 verse 36 started by saying and he's talking to a second person pronoun second person singular that is prophet muhammad he is the first to receive such a verse so god is now telling him do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge so now you ask yourself a question whatever you are practicing in islam whatever you are practicing in christianity whatever you are practicing in judaism or be it any religion you claim you belong to or denomination do you have knowledge thereof? Or are you just pursuing what you have no knowledge just because some scholar, some sort of person just spoke and then you, you hold it in high esteem and you take it. Remember Quran chapter 33 verse 67. On the day of judgment, we will have people lamenting by saying, Indeed, our Lord, we obeyed our masters and our elders, but they misled us from the way. Because you only obeyed, you didn't verify, you don't you don't use your logic, you don't use your reasoning. I played a video from Mumtazul Haq, a Pakistani, and he's just claiming that we are all blind followers. Well, excluding us who follow the Quran, we are not blind followers. Hello, you the mushriks who follow hadith, who follow garbage books, you hold in high esteem, even over the Quran. It's just pretentious. You tell us that, oh, the second highest book after the Quran is the Hadith books. Well, you are lying. You uphold the Hadith books over the Quran. The majority of the people on earth don't even know what the Hadith books actually say. They always go to the mosque. They hear the scholar speaking. The scholar doesn't quote a reference. He just said, oh, according to one narration in Sahih Bukhari, God says this. The prophet says that. That is it. They are okay with it. You understand? So, me actually calling people's heads to use rationality is just to question things that doesn't make sense to you question it now if god is telling us in his infinite wisdom telling us in quran chapter 17 verse 36 not to pursue that of which you have no knowledge are you saying just because i claim i'm a muslim so just because you are praying five times i should just get up like a sheep and follow you no just because you are praying two times i should get up and follow you just like that like a sheep no just because you are praying three times i should just get up and follow you like a sheep no i have to question you remember god will question me as well he will question my reasoning he will question my the mind he has given me the eyes he has given me the ears he has given me what are the benefits when you go to a workplace the boss gives you tools to work with do you think just the boss just gave you the tools in vain 
the boss will question you by the tools he gave you if you don't bring in the good result. He will question you. Didn't I give you the tool? Didn't I give you this to wear? Didn't I give you the, uh, the glasses to wear? So why now are you giving me excuses? And you expect him to pay your salary. It doesn't work like that. So me choosing the topic, let's use our rationale to have a discussion, is just to let people understand. In religion, in Islam, you don't have to be the most knowledgeable person in Islam to practice Islam. But however, you need knowledge to practice Islam. So you, you don't just uh, be in having faith and then you just blind follow scholars telling you their whims and desires. Remember, they are human beings just like you. They will be questioned, you will be questioned. Even the prophets will be questioned. The messengers will be questioned. Quran chapter 7, verse 6 to verse 7. They will be questioned. Quran chapter 43, verse 43 to verse 44. Muhammad and his people will be questioned. So if you just think you will base your faith blindly on some garbage books scholars have written for you and you think you're done. Look, faith, faith, if you have faith and you don't put in the righteous work, your faith is useless. Even Christianity, Christians can bear me witness on this. Quran, uh, the, the book of James, James chapter 2, verse 20. James chapter 2, verse 26. If you have faith and you don't put in the works, your faith is useless. So putting in the works, you don't get up and put in blindly. You are not a fool. How can you put some, your faith blindly in someone that you haven't verified? I work for my boss. I've been working for my boss for over nine years. He has put his faith in me because he has actually put me to the test. He put the trials, put me to trials. He, he saw my capability, how I can be trustworthy. Before he can put his faith on me, you have to put something to test. You have to try it. You have to scrutinize it. This is why God gives the potential. He gives us the capability to actually contemplate his words, the Quran. Quran chapter 38, verse 29. He says we should contemplate its verses. Say, do they not contemplate the Quran? Or are there locks on their hearts? Do, they, do you have lock on your heart that something cannot sink in? Because the heart makes the final decision. Heart, your heart, it makes the final decision. When you love somebody, your heart makes the final decision. When you want to play a gamble, your heart makes the final decision. Your mind is there to help you to reason. Your ears and eyes are there to help you to reason. You reason, but the heart is the main, main decider. That's why when you're blind, it's not being blind from the eyes. It is the heart which is actually blind. You see, so what people should pay attention to is you have you have faith doesn't necessarily mean you should be a blind follower. It is the dumbest thing ever you can ever think of to say you are a blind follower. You are a fool with in capital letters. Yes, who is a fool? Somebody who fails to use who is who is lacking common sense. If you lack common sense, you are a fool. And what is the common sense? You have to have good sense of judgment. You understand? So this is why God is asking several times in the Quran, how do you judge? Because the God who created you is expecting you to use the faculties he has given you. And you are not using. Even animals are better than you. I'm not saying it. God said it. And let's go and check. So I take you to Quran chapter 25, verse 44. Let's see what God says concerning uh, how animals are even better in using their rationale while people are lacking behind. So Quran chapter 25, verse 44, right? And I quote, God says, Am tasabu, hmm? Am tasabu, anna aktharahum, yes mauna au yakilun, in whom illa kel an'am, balhum adallu sabila. Or do you think, the word tahsabu is hasaba, like to, to, to think about something, to consider something to be the case, right? To think. So God is now asking a question. Or do you think that after whom most of them, who are they, people in general, do you think that most of them listen, yes, mauna, they listen, au yakilun or reason? Because if you don't listen, you can't reason. 
if you don't listen, you can't reason. This is why in the academics, your teachers want you to pay attention when they are teaching. This is why when we talk to speak to our kids, we want them to listen in order to reason. When your kid doesn't listen to you, they will never reason on the logic you're giving them. Your teacher, you don't listen to what their teacher is saying. You cannot reason on the lectures for you to pass your exams. So now God is now telling us in the Quran, or do you think that most of them listen or reason? Now, when people can ask you critical questions, it means they are listening. That's why they will ask you questions. And this is what we have to do in religions. This is how we need to question the pastors, the scholars, the imams, the whoever you have. You understand? You don't just listen like a sheep. How do you end up becoming a blind follower unless you are dumb? Unless you are told not to ask questions. That's a blind follower because you have to shut up and do as you are told. You see? So now God is saying, do you think that most of them listen or reason? Then God says, in whom illa kel anham. They are only like livestock. They are only like the livestock. Do you know why God used the word livestock? It doesn't mean the livestock is stupid or dumb. No. The example is, if you go outside right now, go and see an antelope or a deer, a reindeer or something. Just speak to it and see whether it understands what you're saying. It has no idea what you're saying. So how can it even listen to you and reason? When you see people talking to dogs and dogs can understand them, they've taught the dogs for a long period of time. That is why the dogs can understand them. You see, uh -huh. that is why the dogs can understand what they are saying. Can understand them because they taught the dogs and the, 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 the dogs now understand the communication you have put in between you and the dog. So the dog can now respond on what you're saying. You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's true uh, what Kamal is saying concerning marvelous Quran. I don't, I don't actually want to tackle on people who are actually trying to propagate a nice message, even though they might have some flaws, one or two. Uh, what I try to stay up, up, away is to actually bring somebody to castigate the person, or you know. But of course, some of his views are so extreme that you know. Uh, but he, he seems to have some points, but the way he play with certain topics, no, I don't I don't agree with him in such such uh, a manner, right? Uh -huh. So that is what uh, this person is asking. Uh, Danish says, what's your opinion on the Marvelous Quran channel? Yeah. Okay, so let's not deviate from the topic I was, I was just addressing now. So when God says they are just like livestock, then God, God went further to say what? Baluhum adallu sabila. In fact, they are even more astray. That's the people. They are more astray than the livestock. Salam halajat al Because the difference is that livestock you are talking about knows how to go and find food to feed the kids. Knows how to build a house without going to a university or something. You know, knows how to go and find food, to go hunting and find food. So they question things. They set in things. Have you ever studied how a crow does its own life, li li does its lifestyle? Have you ever studied how dogs go for hunting and do things at home? Have you studied how cats do? Have you studied how, you know, animals, when you watch National Geography, do you see how animals control themselves and take care of themselves it's amazing now so god if god is saying they are just like livestock the reason why he mentioned livestock is because you and i knows that without teaching a livestock something the livestock can never understand what you're saying if you like just stand there see a mosquito fly and just tell the mosquito hey come here tell the mosquito hey come here and see whether the mosquito knows what you are saying he has no idea what you're talking about you see, the mosquito has no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, to move on to the next point I'm, I'm, I'm heading to, I take you to Quran chapter 10, verse 100. That is Surah Tul Yunus. Chapter 10, verse 100. Yeah. If you go to Quran chapter 10, verse 100, I can share the screen. Let me see. Let me share the screen for that. Quran chapter 10, 
verse 100. He says, وَمَا كَانَ لِلَفْسٍ أَن تُؤْمِنَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَيَجْعَلُ الرِّجِسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يَاكِلُونَ And it is not for a soul to believe except by the permission of God. Right? And he places the filth or filthiness upon those who do not reason. So if you fail to use your reasoning, your logic, when we are having a discussion, and then I'll ask your logical question, or I'll bring up a logical discussion where you fail to use your rationale because you have been enslaved to follow something blindly. It means you are the dumbest person ever to live on earth. Yeah. Because God says the worst of his creatures are the deaf and dumb. Right? The deaf and the dumb who fail to use reasoning. Those are the worst of God's creatures. So if you go to Quran chapter, is it chapter 8 and verse 22? If I'm right, let me confirm. Uh, Surah Al-Anfal, you go to chapter 8, you go to verse 22. The worst of creatures among the creations of God are the deaf and dumb who do not reason. So if you don't use your reasoning, you are you are deaf and dumb. You are the worst ever to exist on earth. I'm not claiming that. The God who created you is telling us. He says, indeed, the worst of creatures in front of God are the deaf and dumb who do not reason. So when you fail to reason, God places filthiness on you. Yes. Because what is the essence of the eyes, the ears, the mind he has given you? It's of no use. That's why God asks questions. Afala ta'kilun, will you not reason? Afala tubsirun, will you not see? Afala tafakkarun, will you not reflect? You understand? Afala You have to, you have to, you know, you need to use your reasoning. That is the essence of a human being. That is what makes you differentiate you from the animals. Your reasoning. Your, your potential or capability of differentiating what is wrong and what is right knowing the difference on how you have to utilize the brain and mind and the heart god has given you when you fail to use it wisely then you're out of coverage here you see aha uh -huh. so the next verse i'm going to take you to let's address uh, this particular verse right from chapter 10 verse 100 now i take you to chapter uh, uh 67 yeah, chapter 67, verse, that is Surah Al-Mulk. Chapter 67, verse 10, right? On the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, this is what will happen. When you fail to listen and you fail to reason, this is where you end up lament. Now, check this verse and see what is being said in this verse. Quran chapter 67, verse 10. And on the day of judgment, these people who are lamenting, who say, Wakalu Lau Kunna Nasmau Au Nakil Ma Kunna Fi Ashabin Sa'ir. Now they will lament by saying, Had we, Lau Kunna, had we listened or Nakil or reasoned, that is to use your logic. We will not have been among the companions of the what? Of hellfire. Sa'ir. Do you see it? That is Quran chapter 67, verse 10. Using our rationality. Yeah, thank you very much, Fatima Chi. Using your rationality is to question certain things you have been told and how you have been programmed. When something doesn't make sense, reflect on it, put it down, question it, ask questions. You understand? And it's not mandatory for you to follow just everything you find in the Quran, even regardless of not understanding it. No, God never said just follow everything. For instance, when you take the Quran, you see the example of the devil. You see the example of Pharaoh. You see the example of every, even evil people in the Quran. Does that mean you have to follow their footsteps? After God telling you, Quran chapter 2, verse 208, you don't have to follow the footsteps of the devil. But even though I find the footsteps of the devil in the Quran, must I follow it? The answer is no. So it's not everything in the Quran you have to follow. Yes, you can believe in the entirety of the Quran, the book. 
Yes, believing is okay. But you are not supposed to follow everything in the Quran. You'll be the dumbest person on, on earth ever because you fail to use your reasoning. That's why you think you have to follow just everything you see in the book. No, you can believe the entirety of the book, but you don't follow everything. So Quran chapter 39 verse 55 actually give credence to what I'm saying that you have to what? Follow the best of what your Lord has revealed to you. That is the point. You follow the best of it. So the best of it means the capability of the knowledge you have acquired from the book that you use your reasoning to follow. That is what defines the best of the book. So I share the screen and you see the verse for yourself, right? Quran chapter 39, verse 55. Let's see what it says. This is what it says. God says, وَاتَّبِئُوا أَحْسَنَ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَاتِيَكُمُ الْعَزَابُ بَبْتَةً وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْكُرُونَ He says, and follow the best of what has been revealed to you from your Lord before before the, the, the punishment will come to you surprisingly uh, while you are not aware or why do you do not perceive. So following the best of what God has revealed is the goal. Don't waste your time trying to focus on things you don't understand. If you don't understand something, put it aside. Practice what you understand from the Quran with time. Sometimes it takes people a year to understand a topic, a year or two or more. So what you don't understand, don't pursue it. Quran chapter 17 verse 36 clearly tell you, do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. So you don't have knowledge about a particular topic. Don't bother. Don't waste your time. This is why in every aspect of life, if you have knowledge, there's somebody above you. If you don't have knowledge, there's somebody who was even worse than you. So if you are acquiring knowledge, try to ask people who are ahead of you in understanding. Then they can enlighten you. But it doesn't mean they should use their whims and desires. You understand? This is how knowledge works. So that is why Moses himself, the prophet of God, he went to seek for knowledge. Quran chapter 18, verse 65 to 82. He went to seek for knowledge. You can go to seek for knowledge. There's nothing wrong with it. You don't know something, ask somebody who knows better. Right? But it doesn't mean you are enslaved to be a blind follower of that person's knowledge. No, 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 no. Knowledge is any piece of information that you know and you can prove, right? So if I say I know how to fix the phone, it's not about saying it. I can prove it. So I have to open the phone, fix it for you to see that I can fix the phone. That is how I, what confirms I have the knowledge of the phone. If I tell you I have the knowledge of the Quran, I need to be able to break down issues down for you to understand in order to see that I have the knowledge. And that is how the knowledge works. So it's not about verbally just saying that, okay, I have knowledge in this or that before you can actually understand that I have knowledge. You see how it works. So when people make such claims on the internet or all over the world, what they're really saying, don't follow Abu Hanifa, don't follow Shafi, don't follow Imam Malik, don't follow Imam Muhammad bin Hanbal, follow Sahih Hadith only. But oh, you don't know whether that Hadith is really Sahih. You don't know whether that Hadith is, is mansukh or not. And even if it is classified as Sahih, it's not been classified as Sahih by Rasulullah. It's been classified as sahih by other muhaddisun. So if you're going to follow another man's opinion at the end of the day, then what's wrong with following the opinion of a man whose opinion has already been followed about for 12 centuries? So we can't get away from the fact that all of us, all of us are blind followers and we have no choice but to be blind followers. Because if somebody says this is sahih hadith, how are you going to guarantee 100% it is sahih? It's not the Prophet didn't say it, another man said it. And Imam Bukhari, Rahimahullah, for example, in his compilation, there are eight, nine chains. Imam Bukhari didn't meet them all. He only had to base his judgment on what he heard, hearsay. So you have to place your trust blindly on Imam Abu Hanifa or Albani or other muhaddisun or bin Baz that what he is saying is sahih 
And is it really Sahih? You can argue all night and all day till Qiyamat and you will go round and round. We've got no choice but to place blind trust. Yes, we've got no choice but to place blind trust. Now, this is what people will say when they fail to listen and reason, when they fail to use their logic to, to question things, when they fail to use their rationale, right, understand, to, to actually assess things for themselves. That is the end of the, such people, you understand? So don't be surprised. The Hadith followers, people who want to follow external sources, most of them are blind followers. They have no idea what they are doing. Of course, I say some of them know because they are the scholars, they have studied, but they are devious because they are trying to lie to the people while making the masses fall asleep. So when they know, when they use the prophet's name in vain to lie to you, you believe. So you should ask yourself a critical question. How come they have in their Hadith books, they have some they reject and some they approve? Why do they reject some of them? Because they don't see to the agenda. They don't see to their needs. That's why they reject such hadiths. So if that those hadiths you reject are worthy of following, why do you reject them? You should carry them along since you claim you believe all the hadith books. Because if somebody who follows the Quran says, I don't need your hadith books, you call him hadith rejecter. How come if you reject one or two or three or four hadiths, you don't call yourself hadith rejecter? Hello, I call you hypocrites. Yes, they are hypocrites. You see, so Shia has the type of Hadith they believe, Sunni have the type of Hadith they believe, and then you have other denominations and sectors. They have the ones they believe. You see, so let me check. Uh, so far, let's see what some of the questions come in, then I can answer before I go. Yeah, I've put the link. I think I, I pinned the link there. If you check in the comment section, the correct now official officer i put uh the link if you want to join live or if you want to ask a question just type uh if you can call yes the number is there below the page whatsapp number you can call fine then we just have a discussion before i go uh kamal says baba what is the rationale with a lot of muslims who idolize the sahaba they they revere them as if they were so perfect and faultless i don't understand i, I wonder for myself you understand, uh, when we check in the Quran, God says, ma dalla wa ma gawa. You know, the Prophet himself is the, is the Sahaba, uh, is the Sahib of, of this so called Sahaba they are claiming. And there is no. Oh, sorry. There is no instance in the Quran where God actually instructs us to follow any Sahaba, the word Sahaba, to say, hey, look at the Sahabas for you. No, it is the Hadith narrations which actually bring the concept of Sahaba. You understand? What the Quran depicts for you to, to actually take, for example, is the believers, the group of believers, right? Aha, uh -huh. the group of believers. And many a times you see the Mushriks quote chapter, they, they'll go on quoting chapter uh, 9 verse 100, right? Trying to tell you that this is the reason why you have to follow the Sahaba. It doesn't mention sah Sahaba there. It mentioned the Muhajirina and it mentioned the Ansar who actually followed them in, uh, followed them in, 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 in good, in goodness. So if you're following somebody in goodness, God actually told you, do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. So you don't get up like a, a sheep and follow something you have no idea about. So these people, they worship the Sahabas, and that is the reason. I've always said, now go to Quran. Hadith say that a lot of them will be in hell. So how can people idolize them? I heard a scholar on YouTube saying that we have, we have to follow the Sahaba to get Jannah. I really don't get it. <laughs> uh, that is what the scholar will say. In their whims and desires, their agenda is to get a lot of passengers for the devil to enter hell. Fatima Chin says, Allah says, don't be a blind follower. So now he's going against Allah. So yes, it's obvious. They are going against God's words. Yes, they are going against God's words. Salam Khalifa Abdul Malik. Uh, Alam Shah says, uh, he says, Salam brother, in regards to many verses where it is mentioned to obey Allah and his messenger. In my understanding, I believe that this command 
to be the messenger only applied when the prophet was alive. It doesn't apply anymore after the prophet's death. Uh, well, it depends how you understand the notion of the messenger. Uh, there's a difference between a messenger and a prophet. So I see you interchanging the prophet's understanding and the messenger understanding. Nowhere in the Quran does God ever tell you to obey the prophet. It doesn't exist. So the prophethood, his duty only existed at the time, in his timeline when he was alive. You understand? But the messengership duty still exists because it's there. He has delivered the message. And we can see where God instructs the messenger to say things. For instance, if you go to Quran chapter 2, verse 219, yes, when they ask you about wine and the gamble, God gave him the answer to, re, to, to, to state to the people. So that is the messenger in action you're seeing. So when God says there has certainly been a good bathing in the messenger of God for you, that is the messenger you are looking at. You understand? So for instance, when you go to Quran chapter 7, verse 158, the messenger says, Kul, ya you and nas, inni rasulullahi ilaykum jamiyan. He is a messenger of God to you all. So whenever you are seeing these actions of the messenger in the Quran, wherever God will say, when they ask you about the hour, see, that is the messenger in action. He doesn't need to be physically alive for you to see. So anybody asking, uh, acting as a messenger in this modern day, whenever a question is asked, the answers are already there in the messengership duty what you have to take to give to the people. When the people come to you, ask you about the hour, you don't know it. Just give the answer as given by the messenger in the Quran. People come ask you about wine and gamble. Just ask, give us in the Quran. But the question is, people never ever ask the prophet in the Quran or the messenger in the Quran, how do you do the Salat? When they ask you about the Salat, you never find such a question. Because it's irrelevant how I do the Salat. So far as I find the way God has given the examples and I can do even closer to that, it's okay. It doesn't have to be really, really spe specific. I find people telling me, hey, Brother Shah, if you have done the Salat, I saw your video about the Salat. I'm not saying mandatory, that is how you have to do it. Right, I'm only giving you the clue as to the closest to what God says. If you want to do it that way, that is the, this way you can get it from the Quran, right? But I'm not saying mandatory, hey, this is how you have to do the salat. That is the salat. God will not accept any other form of salat. So if you don't do this one, you are going to hell. I never said that. You get my point. Whatever you see in that video is the examples I took from the Quran, and I, I use it to do that. You see, uh -huh. so people misunderstand the notion of the prophethood and the messenger. So Quran chapter 33 verse 40. Muhammad is not the father of anyone among your men. However, he is the messenger of God and the seal of the prophet. So as a prophet, he's dead and gone. As a messenger, his legacy still remains. Yeah. So let's uh go on so kamal says it's very frustrating people tell you to follow sahaba sunnah hadith scholars instead of following the book that god sent uh yeah it is it is frustrating uh because they like i said people fail to use their rationality they keep using uh emotions because you're trying to brush off the years of hard work they've put into things to just uh, you know state your points or give your 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 logical reasoning to things, and they don't like that. So this is why they have been they have been taught in such a way. I will use the word they have been indoctrinated to think tick in such a way because when you are indoctrinated, they don't give you room to question the doctrine. That is how indoctrination works. When you are indoctrinated, you are not giving room to, to question what you have been taught. You understand? You just need to follow it like that. So that is why they have all this school of thoughts. And this school of thought decides on how a person has been programmed, right? That is one thing people should pay attention to. Uh, Mahar says, Salam alaikum all, Salam. Uh, Ayam Man says, Salat is not a ritual. Well, that, well, it can be an opinion as well. It depends. It depends. Depends what you define as uh, a ritual. For instance, when we say ritual, ritual is a prescribed procedure for conducting religious ceremonies. That is a ritual. 
or you can say any customary observance or practice so salat on its own yes we can it's debatable but we can define it as ritual when you say salat because it didn't start from us it started from abraham quran chapter 14 verse 40 where he says kul rabbi ja'alni muqim as-salati wa min zuriyyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua so anything that has been established and has to be passed down by through generations and it keep coming and people have to you know confirm with it that in its own religiously becomes a, a a ritual unless if somebody doesn't know the definition of a ritual or doesn't know what a ritual means like i repeat the prescribed procedure for conducting religious ceremony for instance if i have to go for the salat god says in quran chapter 5 verse 6 kuntum ila salat. when you get up for the salat then wash your faces wash your hands to the elbows wipe your hairs and then your 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 krura that is your leg right so if i have to do this ritualistic thing in order to approach the salat the salat on its own is a ritual but i won't limit salat to say it is a prayer no I, I wouldn't limit it and say salat is prayer no i wouldn't do that but to say salat is not a ritual well you have your own understanding right uh -huh. but like i said i'm available for dialogue uh if you think you know better you can just arrange the dialogue life with me we break down the instances you give me i'll ask you a simple question how did prophet ibrahim did this salat how did muhammad did this salat you come and break it down for him us because god says the book is a clarification for all things i know some people especially some people who don't uh, uh, don't have in-depth knowledge in studying the arabic uh, quran what they do is they will they will go to some quran corpus try to break down their own new meanings and then they will tell you oh you know so that means uh uh, uh to follow something closely whilst forgetting that in arabic one word doesn't only have one meaning you have to check the context just like in the quran when you take the word ayat uh, the word ayat or ayat it can mean a sign it can mean a symbol it can mean a verse it can mean a wonder a miracle and so on so based on the context being addressed at a particular given time it can become a ritual then in another notion when it is used as a verb it can have a different meaning when it's mentioned so just because it's mentioned in a particular instance in this form and you break it down in that form doesn't necessarily mean it cannot mean something else like that for instance the word haram in the quran it can mean forbidden it can mean sacred it can mean holy it can mean a lot sanctioned a, a, a lot you understand but when you have somebody who has a shallow mind in understanding the Arabic Quran, they'll tell you, oh, how can haram means forbidden and means, uh, uh, you know, sacred at the same time? No, I don't understand this. Well, we have a long way to go, right? Uh -huh. So let's deal with the next, uh, this thing. Like I said, so uh, it says, if salat is not a ritual, except the other meanings, it has what about what the verse five, six, Yes, uh, Christian, those people, they put in their interpretation to 5-6. They, they give a different meaning. They tell you because God wants you to have hygiene, to cleansing yourself. If it is hygiene, God will say, go and shower, go to bath. <laughs> he won't say, go and clean, wipe your face, and, and then to go and, and tell you to do tayammum. You understand? So people forget the instance here. It's about, it's about a spiritual purification whereby you have to do it in a ritualistic way uh because if you ask these same people who have this notion can i go and do chapter five verses can i just start with my leg instead of starting as god prescribed it because god says wash your faces can i just start him by washing my legs they will tell you no why because oh, god says i should start with my face so i need to go in line with god says so that on its own becomes a ritual because it didn't start from you the first person who started establishing the salat abraham that you are following his creed he actually prayed to god to make it a generational thing that can continue throughout his descendants so i don't see why people have you know uh so uh 
He says, where is the command from the Quran that says, recite the Quran back to God in your Salat? Uh, your question is not making sense because the Quran is not being recited to God. Go and ask the mushriks, the hadith use that question, that where is that verse? Ask them that. Don't ask me. <laughs> I don't recite the Quran, the verses back to God, right? However, there are some verses you can use to address God, right? Uh -huh. For instance, if you take Quran chapter 3, verse 26 to 27, these are supplications in the Quran you use. It's a verse. You use it to address God. You go to Quran chapter 39, verse 46. There is a verse there you can use that supplication to address God. We have instances where it says, I can say, use a chunk of the verse to address God. It's still coming from the Quran. It's still coming from the book. It's the book of guidance. So when you go to your boss, your boss tells you how to talk to him, how to address him, what time you should come and how to communicate with you. So if you have your different perception of understanding, keep it to yourself. That's you. Uh, people, knowledge is diverse. If you, this is what you understand, stay to that, right? Uh -huh. And then give room for other people to put their understanding on the table. He says, how do you explain homo sapiens and homo erectus with the Quran? Well, you have to break it down. Uh, I'm thinking of doing a lecture, Quran chapter 15, verse 26, 27 to 28. It talks about God creating uh, a basher. And then it talks about God creating uh, a insan. And then it talks about God creating the jinn. Now, throughout my studies of the Quran, I found out that when you deal with the topic of al-insan, al-ins, uh, ins, the human being, and you deal with the topic of a bashar, if you go throughout the, uh, the classical Arabic uh, you know, corpus to find out the meanings, you find out that a human being is more of homo sapien. Then we have, that is the insan, the ins. Then when you have the bashar, you have what we call hominidae. These hominidae and, and homo sapiens, they have different grades of intelligence and how God has created. So in the topic of homo sapiens and homo erectus, yeah, this is, this can be, yeah, it has the sources of the, from the Quran, but this has a divert root of uh, understanding to it where it can be discussed further. So hopefully I'll find time in the future and have such a discussion, inshallah. Yeah. I, I am man, do yourself a favor, all right? My number is there. If you can call, uh, the link is there. I paged it. If you can just jump on, come on live. You know, let me let me just, let's have a rational, uh, you know, a rational a discussion with rationality. Let me just put you to the test and see what you're capable of, uh, you know, putting down verses and just quoting and say, this is what the Quran says about Salat. And I'll ask you to define the word Salat. This is where we, we are going to take it from. So do yourself a favor. You can just call. Call right now or accept the link. I just want you to put it to the test. So Alam Shah says, how is the making, how is this make reciting back to God? There are many verses where it says what to say in prayers as well as supplication. Our Lord accept from us, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your your point is is correct. Uh, Alam Shah, you have a point, yes. Because the Quran is a guidance for mankind. It should teach you how to even communicate with God. There's nothing wrong with that. But some people used to just limit themselves and thinking, oh, no, I can't recite the Quran back to God. Where did God ever even tell you, I can't, you can't recite the Quran back to him? I don't get it. You understand? Is there predestination in Quran, uh, it depends. It depends your 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 de definition of predestination. You know, when you take a word, it can have different meanings, right? Uh, predestination. Are you talking about destiny, or just the predestination meaning? As in, if you can break it down a bit, right? Uh huh. <laughs> Iron Man. <laughs> he says, he keeps saying, Salad is not a ritual player. No problem. That's your opinion. Keep to yourself. Thank you. 
<laughs> Don't be emotional, Iron Man. I, I ask you if you can just come on, hop on. Let me ask you some few questions. Let's see how you can handle those questions, right? And that will, that will help a lot. Uh -huh. If you just put your emotions there, uh, this is not this. You're wasting your time. So 21st century revival of Islamic science. He says, is there any possibility that the verses prescribing ritual salat could have been added to the Quran by those who transmitted to us? Uh, your question is like if the answer is yes then there's a doubt on the Quran uh, we see the notion of the Salat being addressed to the Prophet right for instance Quran chapter 19 verse 58 to 59 it talks about Salat Quran chapter 4, verse 102, talks about the prophets leading a salat. So if we say, is there any possibility that the verses prescribing ritual salat could have been added to the Quran by those who transmitted it to us? If I take Quran chapter 41, verse, verse 42, it says, min yadayi wala min khalfi. It says, falsehood cannot enter it from the front and from the back. So if anything of falsehood will be transmitted and added into the word of God, remember God is God is alive, everlasting God. He has his angels 24-7 available. And then you want to cause chaos in the words of God. I don't think he will allow that to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where faith comes into play. God wouldn't allow that to happen. You know, uh -huh. so your question makes sense, yes. Uh, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't give that too much thought. Tul uh, Kula says, I mean, did Allah already predestination everything before Christ? Uh, it depends. For the actions I'm going to do has not been predestined. Like my choices in life, that is not a predestiny. I decide to go, do good and bad. That is, But I have been inspired. If you go to Quran chapter 91, verse 7 to verse 10, he says, falhamaha fujuraha wa taquaha, afalaha man zakaha wa khaba man dasa'a. And the soul and the one who organized it, it proportioned and inspired it with its immorality and its piousness, right? So as for the choices we make in life, we are being inspired, but we don't call that predestination. Predestination is... When you be born, that is destined. How old you live on earth, that is destined. Uh, whether you are black, white, green, Caucasian, blue, white, brown, that is predestined. Whether you are a man or woman, predestined. You understand? This is how it works. This is how the destiny works. But as for your choices in life where you make bad decisions, good decisions, you understand? These are things you decide for yourself. When it will rain, when the sun will shine, that is predestined by God, right? So we have to understand the notion of free will, free choice, and then destiny, how God has destined things to happen among us, right? So there's a difference. Yeah, salam, Sister Natalia, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, Albert Jose, she is telling Iron Man, it seems like you should start. Yeah, he should start his own channel. I think so. I think so. Uh, he's trying to use emotions here. Baba, what's your view on the 12 Imams? Uh, actually, uh, Kamala, you know, anything else which is coming outside the sources of the Quran, I do, I do make some research, but I don't bother focusing on topics which are not found in the Quran. You see, the reason is Quran chapter 6, verse 112 to 113. In between, he says, Fazaruhum wa ma yafturun. He says, leave them and what they fabricate. So when he's, when I see fabrications, right, which have no source in the Quran, I don't bother to, to even delve deeper into it, you see. So I know about the 12 Imams, the Shia Imams, they keep talking about whatever, but no, let's give it a rest. Uh, so 
A question is asked, he says, but Allah allowed the Injil and the Torah to be corrupted. No one does it say that. Nowhere does it say that. You will never find a single verse in the Quran where God says he allowed the Injil and the Torah to be corrupted. It doesn't exist. The word corrupt is like facade, like to cause corruption. No, there is no corruption. He never said there's corruption. However, they concealed it. They hid it. Yes, hiding, people can hide. Even the Quran, people can hide it. And it's clearly said in Quran chapter 2, verse 159. Inna huda min ba'adi. So hiding the book, yes, people can hide it. But as for corrupt, like corrupting it, how? You understand? Because God has already perfected his word. People can hide it by not giving it to you, but they can't corrupt it. Because the moment you bring it out, you say the word of God, God says we should contemplate it. If we find contradictions inside, it cannot be the word of God. You understand? Uh -huh. So the moment I find contradiction in a book you claim is from God, like the Bible. For instance, God never gave a prophet a book called Bible. And also, God never gave any prophet a book called Old Testament. God never gave a, a prophet a book called New Testament. So these are peop what people wrote with their hands and gave it names. So I wrote a book. This book is called Refer to the Quran. It's written by me. However, when you open the book, you find some verses from God in the book. These verses of book you, uh, God you find in this book doesn't necessarily make this book the Quran. It is just called referred to the Quran. But you find the verses of God here. Similarly, the Bible, we take it, you find the verses of God where they took it from some external source and put it there. Then they claim this is the book God revealed, as said in Quran chapter 2, verse 79. And they actually know the book they have. That is not the book God revealed. They know for a fact. You see, uh -huh. so I wouldn't say the Torah and the Injil are corrupted. And that is why God intentionally mentioned Quran chapter 5, verse 44. The Torah he brought down, the prophet used it for judgment. The, the real Muslims who have that those books, they know. And then Quran chapter 5, verse 57. Right? Uh, sorry, Quran chapter 5, verse 47. He says, let the people of the Injil judge by what is there in. God knows they have hidden it. So he intentionally told them to judge with what is there in. They don't, they've hidden it. And then they wrote New Testament. Then gospel according to Luke, Mark, John, and Matthew. This is according to, not according to God. You see, uh -huh. so that is the point. Uh, Iron Man, no problem. You can, you can schedule for a dialogue. Schedule for a dialogue or you... you you page me, I will schedule for dialogue. I'll bring you. Set it, set your mic up. Set your virtual camera up. I'll bring you. Let's have a discussion, okay? I, I will love this for the benefit of understanding. I, I'm not here to embarrass you or something. But I would love to bring you on to see how you articulate the same things you have been typing, thinking, you know. That's why, that's why I said you should come up. So even if your mic and your virtual camera are not working, do yourself a favor. There's a phone number on the page here. You can just call. You don't necessarily have to be on the camera. Just call me right now. And I'll, I'll just put you to the test just to weigh up how the, your rationale works when it comes to you know the points you make, arguments you state. It's as simple as that, right? For the benefit of the audience watching, right? Okay. Uh, so brother is asking, uh, I bet in, he says, Salam, brother, perhaps corrupt it through making wrong translation through ignorance. Yes, still, that is not corrupting it. When you make translations, right? When you take the Quran and we have the Arabic, right? You have the Arabic. That Arabic you have claiming to be the word of God. Now, when you have the translations, the translations can be tempered with, can be corrupted. Yes, I agree. You understand? But then if you have the translation, we don't term as the original copy. That is why we have something we call a manuscript. A manuscript becomes the original, whilst the translations becomes the translated versions. So when there is a problem, we always have to go back to the original copy to check. Is this what it says? Oh, yeah, it says in this language. You understand? So even the New Testament book, the original copy is written in Greek language. And Jesus was not a Greek. 
So how come the original copy of the Old New Testament is written in the Greek language? There's a problem. Do you do you see the point here? Mm -hmm. uh, you believe Quran doesn't have any single error? Uh, your your question your question is is a trickish question, and to find an error, it's not about belief. Uh, uh, Musa Nasamu. To believe, when you're talking about error, we are not talking about belief anymore. It's about knowing it. So that is why Quran chapter 4 verse 82 says, Afala yatadabbarun al-Quran, walau kena min indi gaira la la wajiduhu fi ikhlaf and kathira. So do they not, not contemplate the Quran? Had it been from Had it been from other than God, they would have found in it there in numerous contradictions, right? So the challenge is just to use your knowledge, your logic to examine things. Just because your first time you open something doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it's a con uh, uh, means it's a contradiction. No, or it's an error. No, you you understand? I give an example. When you started your elementary studies, right? In the first stage, they teach you one plus one. Two plus two. Just to a point, there are certain things you have been taught in class one. Those things don't carry over in class two. For instance, when you are when you are in stage one, they teach you that one plus one. They didn't teach you one minus two is equal to minus one. No, they didn't teach you that in class one because it's bigger for you. So you get to a point. Then they will advance by teaching you that one minus two is equal to minus one so then you know okay yeah, this is how it works so this is how knowledge evolves to a particular point right so it doesn't necessarily mean that when you see something you don't understand you think it's an error what else is there after the truth if not error so if the quran calls itself the truth it's not about just believing it's about using your rationality to actually examine things that's what i can say ladies and gentlemen uh, I think this is where I, would, I have to bring the topic to an end. Ladies and gentlemen, for your time and patience. I appreciate the support and you coming to witness this program. Till then, we meet again, inshallah. Subhana Rabbi Izzat Amma Isifun. Wassalamu ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Peace be upon you. Thank you. So when people make such claims on the internet or all over the world, what they are really saying, don't follow Abu Hanifa, don't follow Shafi, don't follow Imam Malik. Don't follow Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, follow Sahih Hadith only. But oh, you don't know whether that Hadith is really Sahih. You don't know whether that Hadith is, is Mansukh or not. And even if it is classified as Sahih, it's not been classified as Sahih by Rasulullah. It's been classified as Sahih by other Muhaddisun. So if you're going to follow another man's opinion at the end of the day, then what's wrong with following the opinion of a man whose opinion has already been followed about for 12 centuries? So we can't get away from the fact that all of us, all of us are blind followers and we have no choice but to be blind followers. Because if somebody says this is Sahih Hadith, how are you going to guarantee 100% it is Sahih? It's not the Prophet didn't say it. Another man said it. And Imam Bukhari, Rahimahullah, for example, in his compilation, there are eight, nine chains. Imam Bukhari didn't meet them all. He only had to base his judgment on what he heard, hearsay. So you have to place your trust blindly on Imam Abu Hanifa or Albani or other Muhaddisun or Bin Baz that what he is saying is Sahih. And is it really Sahih? You can argue all night and all day till Qiyamah and you will go round and round. We've got no choice but to place blind trust.